going to begin in verse 11. Just be glad I'm not preaching from Psalm 119, okay? <laughs> Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's pray. Father, we ask that the Holy Spirit illumine us, open our eyes and our minds to receive truth, and may we be doers of the word and not hearers only for the honor of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I'm grateful for the invitation to preach. Frank and Agnes were having a conversation, and he says, I'm going to be gone a couple weeks. Who should I get? I'll be gone two weeks. And she says, well, how about Dr. Kistler? And he said, which of the two Sundays should I have him? She said, have him on New Year's. There'll be fewer people for him to offend. But I'm going to do my best. This great passage from Hebrews 4 is of great encouragement to sinking hearts, especially verse 16. We're given a tremendous statement of the mercy of God in this verse, and I want us to look at it in four parts, all beginning with the letter P. Alliteration is one of the preacher's great friends. We're going to look at the precept, the place, the purpose, and the principle. First of all, the precept. We are commanded here to draw near with confidence. The word literally means with an open eye or an open face. Under the old covenant, our faces were veiled, but now we're to approach God with an open face. Paul uses that idea elsewhere. We are free from the slavish fear that was typical of the Jews, but we are not free from the reverential fear that God demands and deserves. We are to come near, to approach, to come to God with confidence. Well, that's the precept. We move to the place, the throne of grace. That's where we're to come near. It's also called the mercy seat. That was above the Ark of the Covenant, within the sanctuary, and it represented God in Christ being reconciled to his people, being gracious and merciful to them. It's called a throne of grace because God's graciousness and free favor accompanies his glorious majesty. Majesty and mercy meet together there. This was typified under the law by the ark. The ark of the covenant, not Noah's ark. You couldn't get a seat broad enough to cover that thing. At each end of the ark was an angel to set out God's glorious majesty, and the cover was called a mercy seat. If you wanted to read about that further, you could read it in Exodus 25. But it was at the mercy seat that God said he would meet with Moses. The Jews said God had a double throne, a throne of judgment and a throne of compassion or mercy. That is a throne of grace. And if it's a throne of grace, then grace reigns supreme upon that throne. And it's to that throne of grace that we are to come boldly and with confidence. That brings us to the purpose. We've done two of the four. Don't get the idea that they're all going to go this quickly. 
This passage is clear as to the reason why we are to come to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace in time of need. We're to boldly and confidently approach the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the Greek language, that's a hina clause, H-I-N-A. It's a purpose clause. It tells you why it's happening. The reason for coming to the throne of grace is to receive mercy and find grace in time of need. So let me ask a question. Is that where you go in time of need to receive mercy and grace to help? I mean, when you're afflicted or distressed, do you go immediately to the throne of grace to find mercy and grace to help? Or do you get on the phone and find somebody who listen to you go on ad infinitum ad nauseum? You call a therapist? Call a counselor before you fall apart? Or do you do what the scripture says and fall on your knees before the throne of God's grace and pour out your heart in supplication, in earnest pleading and confident prayer that all the mercy you need for this time, for this weakness, that all the grace you need to endure this present difficulty will come to God through prayer. Now, am I saying that those other things are inherently wrong? No. Unless they are a substitute for what God says to do. Oh, great. Another ignorant fundamentalist. Pray and ask, read two verses and everything will be okay. I didn't say that. But we've greatly insulted God, I'm afraid, by devaluing and demeaning his resources. God told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. We don't believe that. Paul did. Well, what result did that have on Paul? He tells us in 2 Corinthians 12, Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. Why? Because he felt it? No. Because he'd experienced it? No. Because he was convinced in his mind that it was true? No. Because God said it. There's that awful mantra that you hear religious people say, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it you realize that the middle part of that is completely irrelevant to anything. God said it, that settles it. If he said it, you better believe it. But it's true because God said it, whether you believe it or not. We've lost the mindset of the Old Testament saints who felt that God's mercy was surely sufficient for them. Psalm 90 verse 14 O oh, satisfy us in the morning with thy mercy, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. You realize what that verse is saying. If you're not satisfied, they'll, you won't be glad. The Hebrew word for mercy is hesed. It not only means an attitude, but an action that results from that attitude. It's an intervention on behalf of someone suffering misfortune or distress. It promotes life. And the psalmist said that would satisfy him. Psalm 52, 8, I will trust in the mercy of God forever. That's our hope. In fact, that's our only hope. God's mercy, his loving kindness. It's not by any coincidence that the Bible says in the uh, psalm, do not put your trust in princes. Politics is not going to solve the world's problem. If only we'd won the elect. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He turns it whatever way he wants. God's still in control no matter who's in the White House. Isaiah 55, 3 says these are sure mercies. I do find it interesting. It never says they are swift mercies. 
It says they are sure mercies. And they are the everlasting covenant that God has made with his people. It's the same word, his says. But the word that precedes it is just as important. It's translated in the old King James, the sure mercies. In the New American Standard, it's the faithful mercies. And it carries over into the New Testament as the word amen or verily. Not only is the mercy of God sure and certain, not only is it to satisfy us, not only is it the basis for our hope, there's a fresh supply of it each and every day. One of my favorite verses in in the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, the Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease, his compassions do not fail, they are new every morning. However much you think that you used up yesterday of the mercy of God, no matter how much you feel like you taxed him, this morning when you woke up, it was all new again. It was a brand new supply. Spurgeon once referred to this in a way saying, you might as well be a little minnow trying to drink up the Atlantic Ocean as trying to think that you could ever exhaust God's mercy. Well, what was the response of Jeremiah to that truth? Great is thy faithfulness. The word great he uses there is a numeric word that has no finite understanding. It's so great, there's no way to describe it. It's beyond comprehension. And later in that passage, these things are said to come out of the multitude of God's mercies or his abundant loving kindness. And that's why we're exhorted in Hebrews 4 to confidently approach the throne of grace or the mercy seat to receive this sufficient mercy and to find sufficient grace to help in time of need. John Calvin points out that the words mercy and grace here are nearly synonymous. Both words signify the principle of God's benevolence. So to obtain mercy and grace is just to receive the manifestation of God's favor, proof that God is our reconciled father and friend. And these proofs are given by affording an answer to our prayers, such assistance as is needful for us in the day of trial to enable us to do what the scripture says, to hold fast our profession to persevere in the faith and obedience to the truth. Now, the reference here is not to forgiveness of sins. It certainly would apply to that. But it's in reference to those aids that are required amid life's trials to enable us to hold fast our profession. The writer of Hebrews is speaking of the fresh application of divine mercy and every other blessing of grace that we need And we can expect it because there is mercy with God. That mercy is in Christ, who is the head of what the scripture calls the everlasting covenant. Now, you don't need to be a Greek or Hebrew scholar to know that something that's everlasting lasts forever. The evidence of it is the sure mercies of David. It's been obtained by thousands throughout the centuries. It's been theirs for the asking. It's been sure and certain and faithful. And it's always been sufficient. Interestingly enough, the Syriac language translated the Bible into its own language. It translates this last phrase in time of affliction. Every time of distress whether it comes from the immediate hand of God or through the persecutions of men or the temptations of Satan is a time of need. And mercy and grace to help at these times may be expected because God is not only able to help, but he's promised it. And he's laid it on Christ and he gives it when we need it and it springs from grace. Listen to Isaiah chapter 63. I will mention the loving kindnesses of the Lord 
and the praises of the Lord. <clears throat> According to all that the Lord has bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he has bestowed on them according to his mercies. Again, I, the word according is so helpful. <clears throat> Elon Musk is the richest man in the world, or he was till he lost $160 billion. Now he's down to number two. Hmm. If you ask Elon Musk for some money and he gave you out of his riches, he could reach in and hand you a five and say, there you go. But if he gave you according to his riches, that's a whole different thing. According to the multitude of his loving kindnesses, for he said, surely they are my people, children who will not lie, so he became their savior. And in all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. And he bore them and carried them all the days of old. All the mercy needed for troubled times is available to us. But most of us never appropriate it. Because we don't have any confidence in it. We'll turn to never, all, nearly everything but prayer, or the Word, or the fellowship of other believers, or the sacrament, or any of the other means of grace God has provided. We're going to partake of the Lord's Supper today, and we call it a means of grace. In other words, this is to strengthen us. It's not just to partake of it. It's not just a fellowship time. But when infirmities or afflictions or temptations or the snares of sin come after us with harsh persecutions, then we, by prayer, through our great high priest, have access to this throne of grace. And without it, there is no holding fast our profession. And there is no entering into God's rest. Now, I can hear somebody saying, well, that sounds really great. That's super spiritual, but it doesn't fix my problem. I pray and nothing changes. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 9. He said to God, three times I've prayed and asked you to take away this thorn in the flesh. And nothing changes. So you're at least as spiritual as the Apostle Paul. Commentators are diff have differed over what this thorn in the flesh was. Some have said it was an eye disease, that Paul always had a weeping eye, and it was distracting to people that heard it. But every other time that phrase is used in the New Testament, it refers to a person. Very unlikely that 99% of the time it's a person, and one time it's an eye disease. There was a person in Paul's life who was causing him great distress. And three times he asked God, will you get this man out of my life? And three times God said no. But God, if I don't relieve the stress in my life, I'm going to have a nervous breakdown. And what did God do about it? I'm sorry, Paul. I didn't know, I didn't know how tough things had been down there on earth. Let me get rid of this for you. You don't need this right now. Let me get this guy out of your life and reduce your stress level. No, he said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. In other words, Paul, you've got everything you need to handle this. I've given you my grace and that's really all you need. It's sufficient for you with, for whatever you're going through. My number two grandson's name is Isaac. He is a tough little kid. He's a shrimp, but he's tough. But he is defiant. He's living proof that all infants are not saved. And if I tell him something, he will deny it. Isaac, you just dropped that on the floor. No, I didn't. Or he loves to play keep away. And he say, you can't get me. And as he goes by, I'll grab. I got you. No, you didn't. All my grace is sufficient for whatever you're going through. No, it's not. That's what we're saying. But 
But how insensitive is God to Paul's dilemma? Just as insensitive as I'm being right now, my insensitive remark is this, so what? So what if it doesn't fix the problem or make it go away? What's that got to do with it? The command before us is to go to God. We do it because God says to do it. Not because if we do it, life will be rosy again. We are not pragmatists who only do something if it works. We're supposed to do, be Christians who do something if God says to do it. At that point, you may be a pra- professing Christian, but you're a practicing atheist. Remember, it's our job to be faithful. It's God's job to make it work out somehow. But there's a promise here that I don't want you to miss, and it comes from God himself. Here's the promise. My grace is sufficient for you. Whatever situation you find yourself in, whatever set of circumstances you find yourself in, you have enough grace to get through it. And if God says his grace is sufficient, and you say it's not sufficient to fix your particular problem, what conclusion should we draw? His grace is sufficient. We're just not utilizing it. Notice also that the idea of help in this passage implies a readiness in God to afford relief and aid. God, according to the Greek word, is ready to run at the cry of his children to help them. The problem is so few of us ever cry out to him for help. We go to other things. We turn to food. There's a particular kind of food called comfort food. I don't know how comforting it is when you step on the scale the next day. But how interesting, it's called comfort food, but we have the comforter inside. Some turn to alcohol. Some to television. If you really want life to be rosy again, watch Hallmark movies. Mm. Or to recreation, or to work, or to fantasies, or to counselors, but not to the only one who can help. About uh, 30 years, almost 40 years ago now, I pastored a small PCA church in central Pennsylvania. I know it's hard to believe, but I once was a useful member of the clergy. And a woman in the congregation came to me complaining about her husband. I have a friend who was a pastor in Southern California who kept an egg timer on his desk. And he would start the session and turn it over, and when the sand hit the bottom, he says, we're done here. I'm not that insensitive. But I listened intently as I tried to be sensitive. And I proved that by every now and then going like a, hmm, that must be hard. For me, that's like putting bamboo shoots under my fingernails. But then after she'd gone on a while, I said to her, you know, I'm more than glad to listen to you talk about your situation. There's not a single thing I can do about it. I can't change your circumstances, and I can't change your husband. You've been talking about him for 35 minutes. Why don't you spend that amount of time talking to God? He's the only one who can change him. I learned as a pastor that most people who come in don't want advice. They want permission. They want you to tell them that what they've already decided they're going to do is okay. Deuteronomy 33, 26, There's none like the God of Israel who rides the heaven to your help and through the skies in his majesty. And in this respect, God resembles parents who run when they hear their child crying. Yet God's love is far greater than any earthly parent. My daughter, Michelle, When she was four years old, we put her in a preschool in that little town in Pennsylvania. And uh, they put all the about 50 kids in a room and let them play while they indoctrinated us parents. And about 10 minutes into the uh, little message the teacher was giving us, I heard somebody crying. 
and I knew immediately that was Michelle. I know that cry. I made it happen several times when she was young. But that wasn't a cry of, don't spank me, it was a cry of, somebody hurt me. So I got up and I ran in the other room and the kids were all huddled around there. She was laying on her back crying. And I said, what happened? And she pointed to the boy and I said, he pushed me down. I turned to the boy and I said, don't ever touch my daughter again. And then he started crying, which was good enough for me. I had accomplished my purpose. That's how God is with us. He calls us the apple of his eye. And he says, I don't take kindly who poke me, to people who poke me in the eye. That's literally touch. You are the apple of his eye. That's the pupil. When people hurt you, they hurt the apple of his eye. And he doesn't take kindly to that. God has an ear to hear our cries and a heart to pity us. When Hagar's child cried and Hagar couldn't help, God heard the voice of the boy and brought help. This is all clear in Hebrews 2.18. Look at it again. Our translation reads, Since he himself was tempted in what he suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. We use that phrase today a lot. I know what you're going through. I've been there. Or now it's, I got your back. That's exactly what it's saying there. I know what you're going through. I've been there. And I've got your back. So all the mercy we need, all the grace we need is offered to us by God in Christ at the throne of grace. It is sufficient mercy and his grace is sufficient for us. That brings us to the fourth point, the principle. All this comes as a result of who and what Christ is. He had to be made like his brethren in all things, that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, and to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. It's because of the success of our high priest that we can have success in our Christian lives. His being tempted didn't just have to do with temptation, but with distresses, with insults, persecutions, afflictions, difficulties, rejection, name it. I mean, think of in your greatest time, all of a sudden your friends say, I don't know him. Or how'd you like to have been? We know that Jesus had other brothers and sisters, none of them virgin born, but through natural means. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be a brother or a sister of Jesus? Mom, how come you guys never spanked Jesus? You act like he never does anything wrong. To have your family members turn on you. If we went to a counselor who didn't understand what we were talking about because he'd never been through anything even remotely resembling our situation, we wouldn't have much faith in him. But we can have confidence in our priest. Let us therefore, whenever you see the word therefore in a passage, ask yourself this question. What's the therefore therefore? Because he's been untempted in all things as we are without sin. Let us, therefore, draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The only way we can have confidence in the sufficiency of God's mercy is if we have confidence in the sufficiency of God's mediator. If we didn't have the mediator that we do, we couldn't have any confidence in coming to God. We can't go into the presence of God alone with confidence. We either have to go in the hands of our mediator because our hearts and our hopes will fail us. And it says we can come confidently, literally with boldness, not with arrogance, not with presumption, but with boldness. He's our advocate. 
If you're not satisfied with the sufficiency of the mercy of God given freely to you, it's because you are not satisfied with the sufficiency of the media that God has freely given to you. And God help us if we can't be satisfied with Christ. In 1920, a man named Edward Joy, who worked with the Salvation Army in London, wrote these words. Is there a heart or bound by sorrow? Is there a life weighed down by care? Come to the cross, each burden bearing, all your anxiety, leave it there. And the chorus goes, all your anxiety, all your care, bring to the mercy seat, Leave it there. Never a burden that he cannot bear. Never a friend like Jesus. No other friend so swift to help you. No other friend so quick to hear. No other place to leave your burden. No other one to hear your prayer. Come then at once. Delay no longer. Heed his entreaty kind and sweet. You need not fear disappointment. You shall find peace at the mercy seat. All your anxiety, all your care, bring to the mercy seat, leave it there. Never a burden he cannot bear, never a friend like Jesus. This one, next one is one of my favorites. Both of these you could find on YouTube. That first one was called All Your Anxiety. This one is called Where Could I Go But To The Lord. Living below in this old sinful world, hardly a comfort can afford. Striving alone to face temptation's sword, where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go, oh where could I go, seeking a refuge for my soul? Needing a friend to help me in the end, where could I go but to the Lord? Let me rephrase that. Where should you go but to the Lord? Shall we pray? Father, thank you for your encouraging words. May we now put them to good use and be faithful in doing what you have told us to do. And that's come to the mercy seat and leave it all there. And now as we come to the means of grace, may we be strengthened in our lives as we seek to please you. Amen.